did that. He laid it down for a while, and then his local church needed somebody to play bass. And so he stepped in and started playing bass. And he went to, he was here for a long time before he and I ever even played music together. We just kind of found each other by accident. And uh, Dave travels on the road with me sometimes, does, does meetings with me. And he's just a, a good friend and a way overqualified bass player, way overqualified. Uh, that means he could be doing a lot of the things besides playing bass. <laughs> But but he feels it's uh, it, we all feel a kindred that God's about to rebuild the tabernacle of David, and there's some way we all work in that. Uh, Charlie, stand up there and let's. This is Charlie Goddard. Charlie, uh, you started playing right at revival time, didn't you, guitar? Just right about then when you started playing, Charlie started playing over with Van in the youth in the children's department. And then moved over here, and Charlie travels with me when I go out. All spring we traveled. And Charlie was dedicated in this church. This is his home church. His mother and father are integral parts. As a matter of fact, his mother works in the youth department here at this church. And they're really wonderful people, a solid family. And his sister did work for me a while, but she decided it was too erratic. She was coming out and helping us with the babies, but we're home one week and gone the next, and she needed something solid. <laughs> so they're a sweet, sweet family, and we love them so much. And, and we love to see these young guys giving their gifts to the Lord. Charlie's trying to finish college, and we don't know what's going to happen. We're trying to hang on to him all we can. Next to him, Garrett, will you stand up? This is Garrett Godwin Goodwin. <laughs> I have a Charlie Goddard and a Garrett Goodwin. Now, you tell me you'd get them mixed up. I have them God good, God good, good God, all the time. <laughs> That's Garrett. And Garrett, how long have you been playing now, drums? Five years? All of these guys started playing after revival. It's pretty amazing. In this, when the glory comes, God starts pouring out anointing on musicians. It's really funny. They just start coming to the surface and good ones. I mean, really good ones. And these guys are way beyond their years of playing. And, and, uh, Garrett's family, uh, were a part of this church and came here as a part of revival right in the very beginning. I mean, right starting up, they owned, uh, they owned an RV camp area, uh, RV park over in uh, close to Destin, Florida, over Navarre, and drove back and forth every night of revival, and still drive uh, a ways and are here every meeting, do incredible amounts of volunteer work here. His parents can be found in here stuffing envelopes in the back of pews, tying the envelopes every Saturday. I mean, they they are the heave ho of this church. His father locks things up at night. And uh, these are just really solid people that are a part of our church. And so I wanted you to understand their backgrounds because I, I want to give honor to their parents, but I also want you to understand who this is up here. This is our hometown folks. Uh, Steve Hale, stand up so we see you. Our Steve Hale, please. <laughs> Steve Hale is one of those sickening people we all are sick of because he can play a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? It, plays he plays horn he plays flute i think he can do anything and uh he's awesome awesome and he's been with us. how long have you been here now steve how much about three years five years it's all running together now i mean we're eight in the eighth year and i'm starting to not remember yesterday from tomorrow but <laughs> But uh, Steve has blessed us with this music, and him and his wife are very, very, very strong members here at the church and bless us continually, work in various areas of the church. And uh, Steve, Steve has been battling in his body some things for a while, but we're believing that God will completely bring miracle to him. And he blesses us. He's the flute guy, and he does the penny whistles. And like I said, sickening, just sickening. I, I just don't like those kind of people who can do all that. It just didn't right. And let's see. Uh, you met Mike. Uh, Anthony, this is Anthony McCormick. Stand up there. He's a student. Uh, you, you just graduated, didn't you? 
You're not graduated in one more year, one more semester. Anthony's a student at BRSM. He sings on the worship team. Uh, honey, this is my wife. Stand up, baby. There she is. That's my redhead. <laughs> Becky Powers, stand up there. Becky sings alto on the worship team and soprano, depending on what. So she's holding my youngest son, Isaac. That's my little boy. It's another redhead. There are two redheads in the house. Good Lord, help us. Amber's prayed for him, and I kept saying, baby, his hair is not going to be red. By faith, it's not going to be red. It's not. She said, I have prayed, and God's going to make him have red hair. <laughs> She's more powerful with God than I am. Uh, this is Carol Little. Stand up, Carol. <laughs> Carol sings two or three parts on the praise team, too. And Becky, like you heard last night, was a, is, a, is a teacher. Carol is a full-time mom, but God, her story is a long, long time ago. She even used to sing back with Jimmy Swagger. You remember those days back years ago? If you've got his double live album, she sang a song called Unworthy of the Blood. It was a pretty awesome song. And I fell in love with her voice back then because if, I've, I've told her I've, over the years, I've said, you know what, Carol, there's, there's an anointing to call in the lost in your voice. There's like an anointing to call in and arrest the lost. I remember he used to listen to that record, and I would just weep. And just, there, just something about the, the anointing was on her. She comes from a whole family of singers. All her, sis, her sisters sing, and her parents used to travel. Kind of like us, like my parents, gypsies in a bus. Like, what in the Sam Hill are we doing out here? Did it for years, and I'm glad to have her. Lori Weekly, stand up, Lori, so we can see who you are. Lori, Lori sings soprano, and she has a recording out, and you need to pick it up. It would bless you. Lori and her husband, Greg, have been members of the church how long? 13 years. Now, I want to show you. Lori, Carol, and Becky. Now, my wife got grafted in. When did you start singing the worship team? When you started sleeping with the music director is what it was, wasn't it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I, I'm joking. Gee, I just got in trouble. I just got in trouble. And the dove just flew. <laughs> no. She, uh, she started singing back when she was uh, expecting our first child. But before, before that, Lori, Carol, and Becky, and there are a few other, but these ladies have been with me since the first day. I mean, since, and what you have to understand is five, six services a week, seven in the beginning. I'm sorry, eight in the beginning. How long do we do eight services? It's all a blur now. It was about three, four months, six months. About eight services. We did a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then for a long time, we did six and seven services. And then we just started pulling back a little bit. These, these people have children, husbands, full-time, full-on, all the stuff that other people have, but they are faithful, and they have been right here, and they take what we do very seriously, and I'm honored to have them. Uh, Nolan, this is Nolan Pauly. <laughs> Nolan, and Dace Butler back there, Dace, would you stand up, Dace Butler? Dace just got married. Like, he's got a smile on his face all the time. Just a couple of weeks ago, he got married. And, uh, and he married a sweet girl who'd been in this church for years and years and years. And he's kind of, a, he's kind of a, someone that came in. How did you even get here? Was it BRSM? Did you go to school out there? I thought so. You're a BRSM guy who never got out of here. And we just kind of put him to work. And Nolan came to us from Ohio. And he almost was a casualty of war because uh, for over a year, he, well, how long, Nolan? About a year and a half. But there was a long time you were in a coma and you were in serious, serious nine weeks he was in coma. 
uh, some kind of an infection. I forgot what it was called. Pancreatitis, right? Is that right? And we almost lost him. And he's just now getting back to kind of where he's here with us again. And uh, we love Nolan because without Nolan and Dace, none of this happens. These guys are every bit musicians, as, 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 as much musicians as people who play instruments. Because if, if this doesn't work, we don't work. And, uh, and Nolan has been doing this for years. What's that? He just turned me off. See? You see what I mean? And you, you, you all need to quit fighting with your music, your, your engineers back there, because they'll shut you down, brother. Of course, if they get the spirit of Lucifer, you have to fire them. <laughs> Well, we love you, Lolan. Thank you for your help and your blessings. Amen. All right, I'm gonna, now that I've got all the spirit gone, the dove's flown, um, I may as well answer questions. You always do stuff, hmm? There are some on there. Um, I always love to just mess things up. I love to be unreligious. It's taken me a long time to learn how to not be religious. Now, understand religion. There's pure religion. The scripture calls it giving to the widows and take care of the orphans. That's true religion and pure religion. We should always have that. The other stuff is that, oh, glory to God, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Chi. Oh, do you feel him here this morning? No, did you notice how, did you notice how I kind of, here, here's a good part. I can do this so good. I, watch me. Do you feel him here this morning? You see, I got that look, and I, ki I tilted my head at just the right angle. And you got to, you know, God, glory to God. Got to do a lot of that. I mean, it's just, is there a school that teaches that somewhere? I just want to, oh, and you got to have the bounce. Oh, yeah, the bounce. Don't forget the bounce. Oh, glory. It's three or four. If the anointing's really there, it's a four bounce. I'm terrible, aren't I? I I'm so irreverent. I shouldn't be that irreverent. Stop me. Somebody stop me. Okay. It's hard to unlearn religion. I listen to worship leaders lead, and they've got so much religion on them. They, they got those filler words, Mike. They finish a, a song. Oh, here's, here we go. Oh, here we go. Here we go. This is just for fun, okay? Uh-oh, sound man's mad. They finish the song, right? Hallelujah, glory to God. Halle oh, hallelujah. Didn't mean a word of it. They just were f uncomfortable because it was quiet. If you're going to really have a move of God, you have to understand, you got to get used to quiet. And you got to quit running your services like radio stations with no dead air. You got to understand that they that wait upon the Lord get the good eat. We we're just talking over there about Benny Hinn. If you ever go to a Benny Hinn meeting, one of the things you're going to, you may hate him or like him. I don't really care. He's anointed, so I'm not going to fuss about him. I used to criticize everybody, anybody. It moved. They were on television. I, they were open target. Till I realized one day that my tongue was taking away my blessing and that God was going to deal with any, any shenanigans going on. It wasn't my place to. It was wonderful to be released as the high sheriff of heaven because I... I just felt like I had the right somehow because I received the Holy Ghost when I was five years old under an old-fashioned tent in the sawdust, glory to God. And I had the right to tell everybody if they were right or not. I would, my discerner, my criticizer, uh, my discerner, uh, my whatever it was, worked all the time. But one of the things about Benny Hinn, if you go to one of his meetings, you'll see that he just kind of waits and he waits. And he sings some more, and he waits, and he waits. He's waiting for God. Because he knows that all you can do is sing till God gets there. And he knows that all the 
all the preaching is just words until the Lord comes. So let's get to these questions. Question number one. What source do you use to acquire chords and word charts for new praise and worship music? Especially Lyndall and Jesse Rogers. So glad you asked. Um, Music Missions International has all those. This church has those, but Brenda would probably appreciate you contacting us. We have books on just about every record we've done. Uh, and in those books are lead sheets, uh, chord charts, and in the back there are overheads that you can copy. MMI. Yeah, Brenda's going, contact MMI. Don't call me. Contact MMI. MMI can be contacted at area code 850-479-9981. And before the meeting's over, I'll give you some more information and give you a website. Uh, matter of fact, I'll talk about some products at the very end, too. Uh, how do you pray or deal with worship in a church that frequently breeds into a performance mentality. You can literally feel the dove fly when they seem to be more comfortable with performance than entertaining a place of true worship. This is so frustrating. Can I, I since I, see, I want you to see my secretary type these up for me so I don't have your handwriting or your signature so I can be blatantly honest. Is that okay? So I don't have a face with a name and I don't know who did this. Let me say something to you. On the surface, your question is, how do I deal with, with, with the fact that, that our church likes performance? Well, you're about 65 to 75% of American churches. When worship starts, it's a performance. I walked into one church one night, and of course, they all got the cool little head things, and there's nothing wrong with any of it. I think all of it that you can use is wonderful, but I felt like I was at a Garth Brooks concert because it was like there, it was the, the, you know, the, the guy was working the crowd and it was real, I call it pogo stick worship. All the songs were like, you could wear it, boom, 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 the whole thing. And I thought, well, if we had a good time, wonder what God got out of it. Right? Because a lot of people are into worship now because they think it's exciting. But actually, worship is a very painful thing to do to the physical man. And it's not necessarily always enjoyable until you move over into the Spirit of the Lord. Because it takes a certain amount of dying of yourself over a period of time. Because in order to have more worship offered to a holy God, now keep in mind, anyone can praise the Lord. A prostitute, a homosexual, a liar, a cheater, a adulterer, they can all praise the Lord. Matter of fact, I said that one night in a meeting, Lila, I don't know, I don't know what was wrong with me. The choir had just sung, and they sang a bunch of pogo stick worship kind of stuff, and it was all about we're here to worship the Lord. And there's nothing wrong. I sing those songs. You understand? Well, there's, there, let's state this up front. There are different t things in coming into the house of the Lord. There's outer court, inner court, holy of holies. You got to have it all, okay? okay? We got that clear so don't get anybody mad. It's just when you never get outside, inside the outer court. You never even get past that. And, you know, that's like, we're here to worship. We come to praise Him. That's what we're here to do. I sing, we come to praise Him. We sing those kind of entrance songs, but it's got to be entering into something. When the whole worship thing is, we're here to worship, and we keep singing about, we're here to worship. And He's worthy to be worshipped. Well, uh, duh. One song will do. Now let's move on and let's do it. Let's quit talking. But I find that a lot of worship, and I'm not being critical, I'm just being observative. A lot of worship in churches and a lot of the new music sometimes tends to be talking about what we're there to do, and we never really do it. You know, <laughs> it's, we ought to, and you ought to, and you ought to thank him, and you ought to. I'm still talking to you. You understand? So, 
the choir had sang that night, and they did four, five, about 15, 20 minutes of that kind of music, and then they finally did try to do something that would enter the people further in. Well, the people didn't want to go. I could tell that this church was be, used to being revved up. See, the problem with churches that are used to being revved up and have their, have their buttons pushed and their levers pulled, they work people up into a frenzy all the time, constantly, is that you've, you've always got to outdo yourself from the last time. And the only way that people know how to respond to God is that ah! kind of a response. It's the only response they know. But when things get quiet and intimate, they don't know what to do and they throw their hands down. Some of you in this conference are not used to that. Because anytime we've tried to move there, I've watched certain ones. Now, not a lot, but there are certain ones it's kind of like, okay, what do I do now? You go into the presence of the Lord. You know, because all that pogo worship was for you. The Lord don't need a pogo stick. You know, he needs your heart. You need something to get your body engaged. His, he's already engaged. He don't have to go, okay, I'm here to receive worship. Let me work something up here. Okay. <laughs> all right, now, I'm ready. We're the ones who have to go, I'm in the house of the Lord. Let me get my body moving. Okay. I'm alive. I'm alive. All right, now, worship, worship. We're the ones who have to have that because we've been dealing with everything out there in the world. You know, the most unspiritual time is the time you leave your house from the time you get to church. Is that true, Amber? Wherever she went, but she'll tell you. Because sometimes, I mean, everything falls apart. The last minute, we're running late, and I'm screaming, and she's screaming, and the kids are screaming. And then we go to the church, and, oh, glory to God. So it takes a few entrance songs to even get over whatever happened in the car. <laughs> you know? And say, so oh, we're here to worship. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you ask the question about performance mentality. Two things you need to hear is, yes, there is a strong performance mentality there, but the person asking this question may or may not be the worship leader or have any kind of authority in the church. And your frustration, unfortunately, needs to be veiled and masked. You need to hold it because this could be a judgment call. This could be the spirit of Lucifer. Got quiet, didn't it? You, you, I'm writing my second book. I already know what my third book's going to be. It's going to be The Path of Lucifer because we must understand Lucifer to understand how to worship and understand the pitfalls. Somebody said, what does Lucifer have to do with worship? A lot because his target is worship, and he is so cunning and so crafty and so incredibly smart, and he has a way of making things in the house of the Lord appear to be holy when in fact they are tainted. And it has to do with motivation, it has to do with superiority, and it has to do with submission. And the minute angel, uh, Lila talks a lot about angels. The thing about angels is, I have a feeling, and I believe Lila has the same feeling, we've talked about it, we haven't proved it theologically yet, but we just wonder, if, if a third of the angels fell with Lucifer, that means two-thirds were left, Right? What do the angels, and let, there are, there are, what kind of angels are there? There are messenger angels. There are protection angels. There are warring angels. There are all kinds of angels. There's all kinds of angelic activity going on in this room right now that we can't even see. It's, it's, it's overwhelming the amount of angelic work that happens. God does the work, but a lot of times he sends his angels to do it. All right, think about this a minute. When you get the attitude that you have got something that the rest of the staff doesn't have with God, when you get just a little taint, maybe you do have a greater anointing. Maybe there is a greater touch on your life. But when you get a little bit of a taint on you, I wonder what the angels of the Lord do because they've seen Lucifer when he was in all of his glory as a, as a covering cherub. They've seen him in his rightful place worshiping the Lord and directing worship to the Lord.
and reflecting the glory of the Lord through the, through the, uh, the jewels in his body. And the, he, they've seen the prisms that dance off the walls and the clouds in the midst of the glassy sea. They've seen that from Lucifer. But they also saw Lucifer become tainted and start saying, I want to be like God. I want more importance than I have. I want more acceptance than I have. I want to be appreciated. I'm not appreciated for what I do. That feeling right there is the start of walking down Lucifer's path. Because first of all, you may not be being appreciated properly. But please try to keep, I have to keep myself in line. Because I feel Lucifer always trying to get a hold of me over here. Constantly, Lila. All the time. Because I'm not appreciated. Or I really know how to flow in the spirit. And pastor just doesn't. Now I've got a pastor who really does know how to flow in the spirit. But even though there are times, even with that, there are times that services happen and I go, man, we just missed it there. And I believe I should have just. And I have to be careful how I let that take root because it's an observation to begin with, very innocent and maybe truthful. But the more it's entertained, the more the taint starts to take in, you see. We have to polish those things off immediately and defer glory to God and understand that whether it was missed or hit, I did my job. You see what I mean? Whether the pastor's on or off or the evangelist's on or off or the, the prayer team's on or off or whatever happened or didn't happen, intercessors have to watch that too. Because God actually does speak to intercessors sometimes way before he speaks. to, And I can imagine that Lucifer's hovering over there going, Hey, hey, you guys are really the backbone of this church. But you don't get any credit. You're always stuck back in the back room and not appreciated. And that feeling can start to breed things. That you have to constantly take the, the hand of the Lord. And you have to, through the glory of the Lord and through repentance and humility, buff off that little bit of taint off your brass ring. Otherwise, it starts to take root and starts to canker. And before long, it's breeded on your platform. Somebody walked up to me and one of the ladies said, our whole church has trouble. Friday night, one of the ladies said, our, our church has trouble. Our past, our, our young people lead the worship and, and they feel like they want to do all the new stuff. And our, my husband is the, youth, the, is the worship director and they don't want to do any of the stuff he wants to do and he just lets them do it. I said, what's wrong with you? Don't you do that. We, we have issues here. We have issues here. I have got some of the finest people working with me in the world and very submitted and kind. But sometimes I'll ask them to do something and it may not be what they want to do. And I'm not asking them because I'm mean. Anybody on this stage will tell you I'm not difficult to work with. I'm about the easygoingest guy for a musician you'll ever meet. But... When I ask something in a gentle way, I want them to do it. And sometimes I'm asking to see if there's some Lucifer hanging around in them. Because I can always tell how quickly they'll submit or if they'll come and say, yeah, I have a real problem. I don't have anybody coming to me. I have no problem with someone coming and saying, Lindell, I have a problem with doing that. I don't really want to do that. And then I'll explain to them my heart and why I'm asking and they'll tell me their heart and we'll come to some agreement. But when you ask for something to be done, not order it, but you ask in a very kind way, would you mind doing so-and-so, so-and-so? And then you watch musicians or prayer people or anyone in your church not comply to that. Either A, they misunderstood what your request was, so you want to go back and say it again. But when you see that they are constantly rebelling anything they're asked to do to show a bit of superiority, what's happening is Lucifer's moving into your team. He's moving in. And then you've got to deal with that because God and Lucifer won't share a stage. The glory of God won't come near where Lucifer is. And here's my theory. When you start getting rebellious in your heart and you start bucking up instead of complying and be, I have to beat myself down sometimes. Oh, shut up, Lindell. Get a hold of your, shut up. And sometimes I don't shut up. Sometimes I go home and say too much to my wife. Thank God I've got a redhead wife who will tell me, Lindell, you're talking too much. You're complaining. I love you for that, baby. I really do. She'll say, you're complaining. Hush. Thank God. Because I could talk myself right out of everything that God says. 
I could talk myself right out of the glory, right out of the ministry, right out of whatever God had. And you can too. And I believe that when we start walking down that path of rebellion, just a little taint, I wonder if the angels stand back and go, I don't think I'm going to go near him. Because I saw what happened to the last guy who started moving in this way. He got a third of us cast out of heaven. I think I'm just going to kind of stand back. And that's why I believe some of you, some people in ministry and churches go through hell all the time. Because their ministry and angels are standing back from them because of rebellion. Rebellion don't flow together with glory. Won't ever happen. So the thing you do is keep yourself under control. I can't do it, Linda. Well, cut your tongue off. I mean, whatever you got to do. Scripture says cut your hand off. Scripture, scripture says poke your eye out. Here's my theory. Here's my new, you want me to give the little translation of that scripture? If thy, if thy dell offend thee, shut it off. Because it's better to enter the kingdom of heaven without a Pentium 4 than to go into hell with AOL. <laughs> Whatever it is that's offending you, cut it off, get rid of it, okay? That was a long time, I gotta hurry. So, I understand your frustration, keep praying, ask God to teach you ways to help in intimacy. Bring them to some worship encounters. Bring some of your team to worship. Bring your pastor. Bring your youth. Maybe they'll catch the fire. Maybe they'll catch the vision. If not, serve your little heart out right there until the Lord releases you. Okay? Uh, and leave quietly, please. I, I'm sorry. This is my, my hobby horse, but I am so tired of church trouble. And I'm tired of it coming from my section of the church, too. I am so sick of music directors and, 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 and choir people causing hell in church. I'm tired of it. And you want me to tell you what you do? One more strong word. I get this on me. I'm sorry, Lyle. I try to be brother love, and I just get nasty. But let me tell you something. I just wrote this, and that's the reason I can tell you. How many knows what Velcro is? The rest of y'all don't know what Velcro is. Y'all are so pitiful. Don't know what Velcro is? Okay. You know Velcro, it's got a sticky side and it's got the little side that sticks, right? When you leave a situation or a ministry place or a season in life in a bad way. Now, what's a bad way? With ill feelings? Or you go across town and start another church in the same city that you were working in? Or you cause any kind of headache in the church? You don't understand, Lindell, that's what they did with me, blah, blah, baloney. Get your mouth quiet. I left the church one time. I had a choir of about 175 people. When they would call me on the phone, I would talk to them about the weather. And then finally I said, I know what you're calling for. There was no problem. There is no problem. There is not, I'm not mad at the church. I'm not mad at the pastor. The Lord has released me from that position. Now, I'm not going to pick up the phone again when you call because I am not your music pastor anymore. I love you dearly, but I can't continue our friendship because I'm not there anymore. Now, what did I do by doing that? I cut the Velcro off. Because when you don't leave right, there's a Velcro that attaches to your tailbone. And it's a big, long piece. And you leave just a little bit wrong. A little miffed. A little things untaken care of. Now, little, well, what if you can't leave clean? Well, then what you do is you need to go wash feet, do whatever you got to do. Even if you were right, you go tell them, I was wrong, forgive me. I'm leaving. I want to leave clean. I want to love you. And don't go talk about them anymore. But you got that big old Velcro when you leave long. And what happens is you come into the next season that the Lord has for you. And there's something that's attached itself to the Velcro. And then you leave that season wrong. And you go to the next one. And now you've got like... 50 pounds of junk on your Velcro. So now you're walking like this instead of really walking. And by the time you get to th through two or three seasons, you've got a grand piano stuck to your tail. 
and God's trying to get you to move forward and you can't even take a step. You need, you need a crane to get you going down the road because you got so much garbage. Garbage breeds garbage. Dirt breeds dirt. Hurt breeds hurt. That stuff is seeds and it gets in the ground and takes root and it will affect you. So the bottom line is that even if they do you doggone dirty, if they keep your severance pay, if they treat your kids bad, anything they do, if you hang on to it, don't hang on to it. Because what it does is it hinders you. It don't hinder them. God's going to deal with them anyway. It hinders you. It hinders your babies. You're the one worried about it. They've already hired somebody else, and they're fine. And you're going, oh, God, I, I can't go forward in you, God. The Lord says, look around and see all this stuff. So when you leave, leave good, okay? That was my pet peeve. I had to get that one out. Oh, God, help me, Lila. Okay, in the middle of, uh-oh, I am in the middle of constant debate between the worship team who audition team members and the members of the congregation who maintain that you don't need any musical ability to minister. What is your opinion? I've got one. <laughs> I believe scripturally that we are to study to show ourselves approved so we're not ashamed of what we do. I believe in excellence. I believe, why do you think we rehearse? We try to make things as good as we can with the time we have to deal with. I do believe that. But I also believe, here's the philosophy. Rehearse, 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 rehearse. Then when you get in the service, forget it all. Because if you bring that performance mentality in, you'll perform. But if you rehearse, 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 and you got everybody sick of the songs, and they're like puking, they're going, I don't want to sing this, I'm so sick of it, then you, they'll, sing it, they'll sing it automatic. And then just forget it all and let the Lord move. So yes, I do believe you need to practice. I do believe you need ability to minister. Uh, it, you know, I think a pastor should be able to read. It would be helpful. Brother Lindo, we are purchasing new sound equipment. Our sound team is suggesting inner ear monitors. I am a little reluctant. I know technically for platform sound it's the best, but I love hearing the choir and the congregation. Can you please give me your comments on this? Did you have to get used to it? <laughs> are there pros and cons? Yes, yes, yes. Um, it depends on your, your monitor engineer. If you don't have a monitor engineer, you can back me up on this. Would you, I would recommend no. If you don't have a full-time monitor guy and a monitor console, you're in for trouble. Because a good monitor guy will put, we have house mics here, so he'll put house in there so I can hear the choir, I can hear the house. And I have a, I've had a little bit of trouble with mine, just the molds I had made. The left one really hurts. The right one fits good. And so the only thing I find wrong with them is we switch keyboard players from time to time. And... That's the reason we keep monitors down there because he won't have a, Mike won't have a pair on and I'll have a pair on and it gets kind of confusing. Uh, but if you've got a capable monitor engineer, it's a wonderful thing. It saves your ears. You can hear much better. You cannot sing and blow your voice as bad because you hear better. And I hear our crowd volume is so loud. 105 dB. Our crowd noise is 105 dB. So, I mean, you've got to have something to get over the top of the people. And by the time you got these blaring and those people blaring, if they blared the whole surface, it'd be okay. But then when it gets quiet, these things peel your hair back. So in-ear monitors are wonderful if you have a qualified sound engineer. Can you please speak briefly on prophetic worship? I feel the Lord move me in that direction, but how I do not know. But how do you move into the gift of wisdom? Before you speak prophetically, can it be... You can feel it rising in your spirit, or can you feel it rising in your spirit? Is it prophecy and song, a word, or both? Lila? I have no idea what prophetic worship is, so you go ahead. Prophetic worship. Uh, I, would I would say that when the worship begins to move into the area where you hear God speak, I, I hear you do it all the time. You don't know what it is? No, not really. Uh, the worship will move us into an area. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're suggesting I don't tell you. 
we're doing we're doing fine with it. When the Holy Spirit begins to move, he moves you into a place of the prophetic. Yes. Into speaking God's word and declaring God's word. A lot of times it'll come in song form. Some kind of, I hear you sing it. I hear the you. The Lord speak gives it. me words sometimes. Yeah. And so that's really what we call prophetic worship. Okay. It's it's moving into the realm where God speaks through you. Well, explain something for me. Okay. I hear people saying they play prophetically. What do they mean? I believe that it's when the glory of God gets upon you, just like we were talking about uh, in, in the message the other day, where they are able to play the, the musical instrument will be so, so anointed that it will cause you to be able to hear what God's speaking prophetically yourself. Okay. And, uh, so and I, I do feel it rising. Whoever yeah. wrote this, you feel yeah. sometimes the Lord will be on you and you start feeling like the other night. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday when we were doing uh, the open session of, of, of uh, intercession, I felt when I heard that word awaken, yes. I, ha I felt something right, but I didn't know what. So I went and got her scripture and just started singing mm -hmm. the scripture. Exactly. And I know uh, the Lord spoke to me one night all through the night. I heard him say, you need to hear, have the sound of the flute in intercession. And actually, Steve was the first one that we experimented with that, didn't we? Uh, I was teaching Sunday school across the street this a few, few years ago. And all night, he kept saying, you need the sound of the flute in intercession. Well, we didn't have any flute, flute players. I didn't know where to go. And so I, I spotted out of the school of ministry as Steve playing the flute. So he came to Sunday school one morning. I asked him if he had his flute there. And uh, he came in, he began to play, and the glory of God began to come into the room, and the people began to go into intercession. And uh, it was just, uh, see, in the Pentecostal, and I don't mean to be long-winded in this, but in That's the Pentecostal okay. realm, when we talk prophetic, we think it has to be, thus saith the Lord. You know, right. we, prophetic is having information given to you that was previously not known given by God. It does not have to be a form. We need to break that in our thinking. So when God begins to transfer information into us uh, when we are worshiping, then that is prophetic worship. I remember the first time the Lord gave me the interpretation of tongues in a church, and it was in song form. And I remember some of the old-timers really had a problem with it because I was singing the interpretation, and I wasn't saying it in King James. Thus saith the Lord, for yea. But see, I don't talk like that. I read that. I, I ooh, <laughs> sorry, leftovers from last night. Uh, and you know something? I don't even believe in all that. I don't even. I used to, whoa, this is the very thing I had trouble with Toronto over. And last night, I messed up. I've never done that, that bad. I don't even know what it is. But I just got a wave of it, whatever it is. Wow. Hmm. I wish I wouldn't do that. It's not very flattering. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I left here just totally sauced last night. Walking backwards. I had all the worship team piled up in the floor. It was a mess. Hmm. I haven't done that in years. Okay. I helped lead. <laughs> Stop. Okay. I know it must, I don't know what about that, but it sure makes you feel good. It's just, I help lead worship and praise in a multiracial church, and our church is mainly contemporary vineyard style music. I want to incorporate gospel, yes, into our worship to meet the need of worship for everyone. How? Uh, I always get the question that you didn't ask answered, so I'm going to ask the one you didn't, answer the one you didn't ask. First of all, we want to meet the needs of the Lord first, then the people. 
the Lord first, then the people, okay? Now, concerning gospel music, gospel music is great entrance music. It's great, uh, it's, it's great entrance music. It's great outer court stuff. Uh, very few of our gospel writers, <laughs> very few of our gospel writers are writing real intimate inner court kind of stuff. There are some. Uh, the new Kirk Franklin CD is, is, is moving way on in further than he's ever moved in before. And so I see God moving. I see a wave of the Lord coming there. But uh, what you're going to have to do is learn how to pull parts off of tapes. Uh, is the person who asked this question, are you the worship leader? Are you here? Why am I answering this? The Multiracial Vineyard Church, are you here? Are you the worship leader? You're part of the praise team? Uh, if you've got someone, brother, who, who is uh, capable of actually, when I say lifting parts, uh, Mike does it all the time for us here. We'll get a song like Hosanna Forever that we did here. And again, those songs may be worship and praise, but they're very performance oriented because a, a choir thing, especially a gospel choir, tends to make people uh, spec, spectate more than enter, enter in and participate, but they're good openers. And uh, we just lift them off of the CD. We actually listen and write the parts out. So you'll have to have someone capable of doing that. And then you'll have to start reading through your singers and take auditions and find out who can sing soprano, who can sing alto, and who can sing tenor. And then when you find out what you got, then you just start trying to mimic the sounds that you hear on the gospel records. And you know, white folks have a tough time. It always comes out a little bit yellow. It's never really black. It's not even a good shade of gray. It's just kind of yellow. And you know, our choir is the best yellow choir you'll ever meet, but we ain't even close to a gospel choir because there is a gift the Lord has given the black race. It's, it's, it's the Judah. It's that jubil thing God has given them. There's a jubilation in their voice, and there's a cavern back there that white folks don't have, and there's a gear that they can go to that we just can't even go for. But we sure have a tough time. Well, we actually have a joyful time trying it anyway, even though we can't pull it off. So, but try as close as you can. But I find with our choir, like on the end of Hosanna, that we just can't go there. We try, but we can't get there. Uh, it's the best. It's the best yellow offering we can give, but which is all we got. All right. So that's not a racial statement. It's just the truth. Does that help you? You got to lift the parts off yourself and just teach them to the choir. Um, uh, okay. I just got a few more. Lila, do you have men on your intercession team? Discipled under Lila Terhune. How do I, as a young woman, operate in the position of a worship leader? Okay, you answer that one first. Yes, we do have men in our intercession team. In fact, Steve is a part of our intercession team. And uh, many of the people are dual. You know, they are with the worship team and the intercession team. That's right. um, most of our men are working during the day. That's why you see mainly ladies. I would say that the predominant portion of the of uh, our intercession team is women, but we do have men, yes. And what about the working under you? They, they're discipled under you? Uh, well, no, I think that's a question for you. How do I, as a young woman, operate in the position of worship leader? No, the one above. <laughs> oh, disciple. Yes. yes. <laughs> Well, we kind of. Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. We, we have a very strong um, foundation at Brownsville of um, of submission, and it isn't submission to uh, you know your your gender, and it isn't submission to um, you know a power issue, but because of the submission that we are all taught, uh, if you come into a department, regardless of who is the one that's in charge of it then there's a, a submission. So I don't have any, any problem with that. I don't know. This may be a doctrinal question as far as, uh, you know, uh, your background. Yeah, women in the church. And that would take a whole lot of, a lot of um, answer. But I, I hope that, that that would answer for you here. We don't, have any, we don't have any gender problems. Yeah, we're fine with people, with ladies ministering and preaching and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, 
yeah, this is a doctrinal question asking, is this a legitimate position according to scripture? And I just, I, 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 I'm kind of lagging to get into all that because that. There's, there's out there on this subject. Yeah, there, could, and that could get purchase. real. Mm -hmm. We don't have an issue with it, uh, with lady worship leaders, training men worship leaders. The only issue we have is not giving room for the devil to make sure that when you are a woman worship leader, you don't have a man in your office by yourself because we don't believe anybody has a Holy Ghost below the waist. I'm serious. We don't believe in that. We don't put men and women in offices together alone. We keep doors open around here. We keep everything above reproach because we're all capable of falling. You hear me? We're all capable. You ain't that spiritual. You, you know what? God created you as a human being. You, you, you're a sexual person. God created you to be so. And it's very natural and very normal. But God wants it to be in the confines of your marriage to the opposite sex. And so when you start putting yourself in positions as young men, young women, you can't do that. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. And that, old, that saying I said was a little crude and crass. I apologize, but it's one of my grandmother's sayings. Because she believed that. Because she knew how things were. And it's, it's good that we bring some of those old timers' sayings back and understand that we are not that strong. If we're that strong, then why do major ministers fall into sexual immorality? Why? Because they didn't count the cost. They didn't understand the power of the sexual drive. And we have to understand that we must guard against any of that. And it's an uncomfortable subject. People don't like to talk about it. But if it's time we talk about it, they aren't afraid to talk about it on television. And we need to talk about it in the house of God in a way that will make people understand. Because I'm telling you something, musicians especially, I don't know about intercessors, but musicians especially, I'll just say it. I want to tell you something. You get with a bunch of musicians who are halfway with the Lord. You'll have every kind of sexual perversion going on in the world because of the creativity in them. See, creativity means they'll explore. Whereas a person who's not artistic or creative, they won't step out of, of things. But there are minds that create we're not only always thinking on the positive creativities, but we sometimes start thinking on the negative creativities, and we wonder what that would be like, because it just comes into our mind. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Am I speaking to a bunch of dead people who don't have these issues? No, I don't think so. You got some religious folks here that think they don't have these issues, but the reality is, is you do. And what has to happen is you can't be messing around with sexual things and you'll forfeit the glory of the Lord in your life. And the only way to keep that under control is to keep it exposed constantly, to talk about it, to make sure that it's understood that we don't do these things. We don't pair off in any way. We don't innocently get in the car and drive to town if you're a married woman with a, with a, with a single man. Why? Well, some people go, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I don't trust me. I don't think I would ever do anything like that, but I'm not going to leave myself open. It's just very prudent, especially if you're in the ministry, to be careful. Because now here's the other side of that. There are people sent in here by witches, covens, and things like that that know how to play church with us. We have witches all the time. All the time. Matter of fact, we know a few of them. And I look for them at prayer time. <laughs> Because they think if they can touch you, they can leave a spell on you. But I got the blood of Jesus. They can't do that. So I just look for them. I say, come here. I'm going to pray for you. You know. But it's, it's, it's common knowledge in which covens that they will send people in, ladies and men both, to infiltrate congregations to bring people down into sexual sin. They'll do it. And how do you know? You don't know. So the best the best theory is when you're in ministry and you've got a high profile position keep your slate clean even if it's inconvenient you know uh, one time Larry and I were talking about this and, and he said it feels like it's a little over the top but I understood Jesse Rogers came up here and we were all going on a ministry trip together and she was going to be in the car with a bunch of married men and she refused to do it she said why don't you get 
let me bring this girl with me to travel with me. And, of course, we started reasoning, going, well, you know, if there are two of them, they're still married men, come on. But it was just an accountability issue that she was comfortable with to understand that, hey, we're going to stay accountable here. We're going to be careful. So let me challenge you in the name of the Lord. Be careful. Don't leave any occasion for sin. I, I feel by the Holy Spirit right now I need to approach one more thing, too. Young men, you have got to watch that Internet consumption of yours. Because there's too much on there available to you. There's too much on there available to you that it would be detrimental to your soul. You need to not have that computer in a private place. Do you hear me? If you cannot, because I'm telling you, you are a young man and your hormones are running wild. And I know what I'm talking about. I was 18 years old when satellites first came out. I went and bought one. My dad didn't want me to, but I bought it and paid for it. I was working. And back then, nothing on the satellite was scrambled. Everything was available. I had never seen pornography in my life, ever. Never, ever had I seen it. I was innocently with my parents going up a couple of satellites and ran across some, what was called softcore porn. Well, we just kind of went, oh, you know, turned it off and, and, and never approached the issue. But my eyes saw just a glimpse. And so, see, I hate to get into this, but I need to, Lila. I believe that in family lines, I don't want to call them curses. I want to call them demons. I believe in some bloodlines there are demons attached that are there looking for any loophole they can get in. The blood keeps them out. But the minute they get a soft spot in you, they will come. And I found out years later that my great-grandfather was a gambler and a womanizer. And actually, my, gr my grandfather and my father went and got my great-grandfather out of the Mississippi River. He had been shot in the head for a bad gambling debt, a, a, a cinder block tied to his ankle thrown in the river by a woman's husband whom he had had a sexual affair with. What a pedigree I'm from, huh? <laughs> then I started talking to some of my cousins, and I started talking to my father about these issues once this became exposed in my life. And I found out that all down our bloodline, there was a real pull of sexuality in a wrong content there. And just that glimpse, man, that glimpse, my curiosity was up. So I slipped back in the living room while my parents were asleep and tuned back in. And I was appalled and re just backed off for what I saw. I thought, oh, it's awful. So I turned it. But yet my curiosity kept turning back. And then I turned it. And I turned back. And before I knew it, I was into full-blown pornography, hardcore stuff that I was tuning in in my father, who is the pastor of the church, in his living room at 2 and 3 and 4 in the morning when he was asleep. And it got a stronghold in my life. Satan found a little soft spot. And for years, folks, years, I struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled. I had prayer for me so many times, I felt like I was going to be bald-headed. I didn't think I was going to have any hair on my head for the people who laid hands on me. I didn't think my, my knees, my pants were going to have knees in them because I just worn them out praying because I knew that I couldn't come into the house of the Lord with that stuff on me. And I would repent and I would apologize to God and I would beg God's forgiveness and I would be okay for a few months and then I'd fall right back into it. You know when I got free? When I took the satellite out. Is that easy or what? Because I had too much religious pride and spiritual pride, I didn't want to get caught. I wouldn't go in and buy it. Because my dad pastored in the town and I didn't want to get caught. So I made it harder for me to get to something that was causing me to fall. I just shut the satellite off and presto, no more pornography. The situation you're in right now is more, di more dire than not mine. Even to this day, even with my internet usage, I 
I'm careful about overspending time on the internet. Why? Because I know what my weakness is. Do you hear me? I'm a man of God. I believe I've moved to a place, but once there is a weak place, Satan will always work on it. And that's why the scripture says to know the ways the devil works. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. If you've got an issue, get rid of your computer if you have to. Don't even have one. Or if you've got to get on the internet for some reason, go to a public place. Or put one in the kitchen on the table where anybody can walk in at any time and see you there. And make sure it's not available to you after hours. Why? Because you're weak? No, because you're smart. Because his glory is more important than your sexual appetite. Boy, I don't know why I'm hitting this because I feel like there's some stuff in here. There's some stuff in this room that needs to be dealt with. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not heaping condemnation. I'm telling you freedom. You can be free. You can walk clean. You can be free. You can walk pure of it. You don't ever have to go back to it. But the bottom line is you're a human being. And if you let yourself go, here's how I believe. I believe at the, I believe at the end of a, here's the way I say it. All of us have things. Yours may not be pornography. Yours may be lying. It doesn't matter to God. You understand? It's all the same. It all does the same purpose in our life of separating us from the Lord, right? Imagine, if you will, a, a PVC pipe, about like this, big one. Imagine that one end of that is a fan blowing, just a gentle breeze blowing. And at the other end is a spider web with a great big old black widow spider, a poisonous spider. And guess who you are? You're a fly. And you're in the PVC pipe. Your option is to quit flapping your wings and become spider lunch or to keep going against the things and keep sweating. This is Paul called it running the race. Keep running the race because there is no in-between. You either run or you go back. There is no standing still in this race. You understand? And waiting at you, waiting for you at the end of that pipe is all those things that God has brought you out of. See, God brings you out of them, but the devil doesn't forget what your appetite is. And he keeps it there just waiting. Somebody said, that sounds like a struggle all my life. It's not. Because the Holy Spirit is with you. And he empowers you and gives you strength. The scripture says, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall keep running against the wind. They'll keep flying against all odds because the strength of the Lord is on them. Oh, I don't know why I got on that, but let me move on. Did that help anybody? Good. Uh, how do you communicate between musicians? We have trouble communicating. You're right, we do. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Do you guys know? It's really hard for us. It's hard for us to communicate because it's hard to find time to hang out. You know, we don't have a lot of hangout time around here. And uh, I don't know if you're talking about communication and in, in, in just talking and hanging out or if you're talking about communicating on the stage. But uh, we're still working at that one. I don't know that we figured that one out yet. Um, we try. How do we do it? Y'all got any ideas? What's that? If you, I don't know. Is the person who answered this question, could you expound on it? Are you there? Are you here? Yeah. What? What are you? At, in what context are you asking? Ah, okay, that I can answer. I, I just went into a bigger thing than you ever meant for me to go to. Uh, we, we basically have signs that we talk, and, and, and they read my body signals pretty well without me even do the hand signs. But, you know, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, bridge, first ending, first ending, ending, ending. You know, I mean, it's like we have different things that we want to stop doing, sections of a song we want to stop doing. This is always stop. This is do whatever we just did again. You know, if it's a chorus, if it's a line, do it again. And then, yeah, and then we do, uh, if we're doing a song the Lord has just given me or something that's new, we use numbers here. 
Uh, we use the number system. Uh, it's real simple. It's based on the scale, uh, the basic scale. It's going to blow your mind at first, but it's real piece of cake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay? It's just that. And so if you're in the key of C, and it's F, it's four. If it's G, it's five. You know, and, and there's certain things you take for granted in doing this uh, because there are, are relative minors that go with the chord of C, which are D minor and A minor. And so when we say go to a two, most contemporary music means go to a two minor, not very, not always a two major. And sometimes if it's a six flat or something, I'll, I'll go like this to let them know it's a flat or we're going down or we're going up, kind of that kind of stuff. Just sign language. Just we've kind of learned how to work. Does that help you? Just choruses, bridges. Almost done. A couple more questions. We're moving on. During intercession, when God speaks to you, do you see a visual picture in your mind, or is it more of an idea that has dropped into your thoughts? It can be any and all, either, uh, and other ways. As I said earlier, interse oh, the um, prophetic is when God begins to give you something that you hadn't thought of before, or he begins to give you information. Uh, sometimes our people will be impressed with a, with a scripture, uh, sometimes you'll have a little, little what we call a, um, it's not a vision, it's an impression in your spirit. I'm not a person who sees open visions, but it's just a knowing, and I guess we go from there. I think, I think yesterday you probably saw the demonstration of what, uh, yeah, of how these questions people. are the first day, so they yeah, that's them. true. So hopefully we covered some of that yesterday. Last question: How do you handle the call to intercession or praise and worship leadership when the pastor is not interested? We all know to submit, we know to submit to his authority, but wanted to know if we are given the burden what to do until something breaks through so as not to step past the line of authority. Do we pray off campus? Do we put limits on our songs, etc.? Lila? All right. <clears throat> Obviously, we never step past the leadership. Uh, we believe in full submission to our, the authority, and you just continue to pray. We do not meet together off campus to pray for things that we have to do in the church. We do have, um, some of us get together and pray specifically for the pastor and the family on occasion. He knows about that. That's totally, totally with his approval. But other than that, we do not get together and uh, what I call gang up. Because what will happen quite often is it will get into the area of what I call spiritual gossip. And um, <laughs> this is a killer. Well, if we were teaching, we would really go into this because uh, it gets out, the, out of the line of let's pray about this. And the next thing you know, we have undermined the pastor. And I get tragedy stories all the time. Pastors who have shut down intercession and in, they've been willing to allow it to happen. But because that Jezebel or that Lucifer or whatever spirit gets in the critical uh, spirit and will begin to undermine leadership and truthfully can even destroy a church yes that's how much power can go on uh, in the quote prayer i even have a little bit of a problem with um, with with prayer chains because of what we have seen in the past so often of them when so often we've seen when they go to give a prayer request by the time they finish they've done most of the down and dirty and very little prayer and uh, if you were as a child uh, play the little game telephone Okay, the first, are you any of you old enough to remember that one? And you would start out with a sentence, and by the time it had gone through three or four people, it, it in no wise resembles what the original sentence was. So you can be calling because the, the pastor and his wife have a problem. By the time it's gone through seven or eight people, they're getting a divorce. They're, one of them's having an affair with somebody. And so it turns into a gossip sense. So I believe that we need to stay in a place of prayer and just keep asking the Lord and, and do not do what I call witchcraft prayer. Try to pray your conviction on the pastor. Oh God, teach him this, show him this. You know, this is a manipulative way of prayer. Oh, girl. We need to pray and ask God, you know, your will and your desire. And those that wait upon the Lord, and believe me, you're not going to suffer as a result of it with the additional prayer that is you're praying for, for God's love and kindness to come into your church. God does miraculous things. Either he's the God that changes men's hearts and minds, or we're just praying about nothing important. So I hope that answered the question. Just Good. stay, keep praying, and uh, see if the Lord doesn't move upon your pastor, and he may never. But you can still keep praying. 
We hope that that helped you. I received some questions after, but we didn't have time to get into them. But that. Someone had asked me about the the um, flag of the world or this. We get those at Walmart, and uh, so I don't know if um, I got those at, on Nine Mile Road. I don't know if all the Walmart carry them. They're in the bolts in the fabric department, and uh, those are pretty cool, huh? They are, you know, pieces of fabric that have the world on them. Commercial for the all. world. Co yeah, somebody asked me about banners, and uh, we you could order sets of banners through through our website, I believe. Wait, but and um, what is it? Uh, www crosspollination.com and we didn't even talk about products today should come, we come talk about should them we? real quick we'll well, because, because they've asked some questions people have come up and asked me about intercession and I spent one year uh, developing 28 different 45 minute uh, intercessions sessions on training and teaching some of the churches are using them we're at present still working on a teacher's manual and uh, and student workbooks and uh, the 45 minutes Believe me, they start from basics of intercession. We go through prophetic uh, actions. We we talk about the Tabernacle of David, the the Ark of the um, Altar of Incense. We talk about how at the very last one is how to develop your own intercessory prayer group. And so we have them also in video form. Uh, they're in seven videos with four 20, 45 minute sessions on each one. And um, so we would love for you to have that. And we wrote a book a few years ago. And there are other products out there, but they need to go to the product table. I'm handing it over to you, Lyndall. Let's talk okay. about your stuff. You need to get you need to get those those materials. They'll bless you. Mm. How many of you have read her book, Cross Pollination? See, not enough of you. You need to read it. You'll love it because Lila has opened my eyes to intercession in a way that I never knew. And I am just honored to know you and be a part with you because it's it's, it's fun for me because it's like You've been waiting for someone to say the things you were hoping that weren't all just in your imagination. You know what I mean? And, and, and Lila will start speaking. I'll go, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that was it. And they've encouraged me so much just to, you know, I remember Ruth Heflin used to come here a lot during revival. And she used to always tell me, she said, Lindell, prophesy, prophesy. It was so uncomfortable for me because I came from Pentecostalism. We didn't, you know, prophecy was something, one of the gifts of spirit we didn't operate in. And if we did, we were always suspect of it. But I learned that prophecy is not always what I thought it was. Sometimes it's just declaration of what the Lord has already said. Sometimes it's at a moment's notice begin to declare what the Lord has already said. It don't always have to be real mysterious. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's how you learn it to get into it. Um, let me cover a couple things. Um, Larry, do you have those brochures here? Are they here yet? We have them. Uh, if you're interested in any of the music and that you weren't able to pick up this week at the conference, and uh, no, hold on, just stay right there. If, if you're interested in any of the music and any of the upcoming music that we have, if you would like to be on the newsletter, if you would like to know what we're doing, if you'd like to know what's going on in, in the worship encounters, where they're going to be, uh, if you lift your hand, we'll give you a brochure. The information is on there, and uh, somebody will pass those out. And uh, if you got a chance to get out there, this is the conversation with the worship leader I was talking to you about a few days ago. And this is the conversations with the worship band I was talking to you about a few years ago, a days ago. <laughs> Feels like years. It's been a good time. Uh, while they're doing that, also we have a book called The Touch of Glory, I think that might bless you. Uh, I get the same questions over and over and over, and what I try to do is create materials to answer the questions I keep getting, like Lila does, because you keep getting questions, same ones over and over and over. So we put these video series together, we put the book together, hopefully to answer some of those questions, so you understand. I'm a very, have you figured out, very candid, very open kind of speaker and communicator. I just, I don't hold anything back. Sometimes I get in trouble and I walk away from the pulpit and beat myself up and go, what did I say that for? I wish I hadn't have said that. But I think it's most important that you understand that there's nothing here that's incredible. It's just what God has done. That's all that's incredible here. All is what the Lord has done. And we're just trying to steward what he's done. Okay, now, I want to share about 10 minutes with you and then we're going to kind of have a worship time together before we adjourn today. And I know the kids are coming at 1 o'clock, and if you have kids, how many have kids out there? 
Okay, if you have to excuse yourself at one to get your kids, you can bring them back in if you want to. We don't care. But uh, we're not planning on going much past one. But I want to really be quickly and tell you a couple things. I told you Monday that I, I believed, or Tuesday rather, that I believed that we were between two worlds. We are between the ending of Saul's reign and the beginning of David's in the church. Not, and again, not the pastors I'm talking about. I'm talking about overall how we do things. We've, we've pleased people too long. I don't know what's coming, but I've got an idea. The Lord has given me little glimpses of it. I believe, first of all, that whatever is coming has to do with waiting on the Lord. Because I think the Lord is tired of us treating him like Burger King. I think the Lord is tired of us coming into the house with our needs and saying, Lord, we want this and we want to push the button now and give it to us now. I believe God is about to come show up in miracles, signs, and wonders, and I want to talk about those healings before we go because I believe that's what God is about to do. And I believe worship is about to bring that onto the forefront. But I do believe also, and I want my musicians to hear this because it's, I'm going to say it until they're sick of hearing it, and the singers, whatever it is God is about to do for us and do with us is different than what he's done before. Therefore, it requires something different from us. It doesn't require a list of rules, but do you ever wish that you could be in meetings where the dead were raised? Yeah. Let me ask you why. Why do you want to see that? And I think if you can answer that question rightly, then we'll get to the, the basis of whether he will or won't. And whether or not you'll be a part of it or not. Because I think God is tired of people in flashy clothes taking his glory. God is tired of the guy coming in, riding on the big horse, saying, hey, I did it. It's my ministry. Come on in and support us. There's nothing wrong with supporting ministries. I ask for support for mine. These, these videos cost me money. I have cost me $60,000 to make a CD. I need to make a new one. I don't have 60000 Yes, I take donations. I take supporters. I have partners. All those things that I used to choke on about six years ago, God has just kind of made me face and go, hey, you got to ask. You don't get it, you don't ask. But the other thing that I'm saying is not that. I'm saying that we've got a prototype in our head that when God does something, it's always a guy up here that's making things happen and moving it along. The prototype I believe God is about to unleash in the church is from the pew. I believe that the worship is about to come from the pew. That's the reason this performance stuff up here has got to die an early death. That's why this stuff of rehearsing the band and flashing the audience has got to go away. It's okay to enter the house of the Lord, but it ain't nowhere to go in the glory. It won't take you anywhere. Because the minute I start to play the piano, you stop worshiping. You'll be doing free worship. And the minute I start going da-da-da-da-da, you stop waiting on the next song. Why? Because you're programmed for another song to come. Because you're looking for me to come up with another mood, another song to take you further into the presence of the Lord. That's performance. It's got to go away. It's got to stop. But it's because you're programmed wrong, and so am I. We've got to unprogram. Our, that's not normal. That's abnormal. That is system of the world in the church is what that is. It's okay to get us by for right now until God gets to what he wants to do, but it's the system of the world. The Lord said don't bring the world system into his house. I said, the Lord said, don't bring the world system into his house. I just shot some of you in the head because you want a performance ministry. But I'm telling you, if you want to see God's glory in the last days, you're going to have to let that die. It's going to need to die a quick death. It's going to have to go down the drain fast. You're going to have to totally disappear. I've got to totally disappear. I can't wait till worship CDs are the arena at St. Louis. Worship live. And nobody knows what it was. There were singers, but and their names are on there. We give them honor. We give them credit. We may put their picture on there, but it's not important. Because it was the event that God had brought about. Because people were coming into arenas to worship him. That caused things to happen. But we've got to learn to wait, folks. You've got to pr If you can't get your church to wait, get your team to wait. Get some time with your team where y'all just wait. This church waits somewhat. But here's what I found out about waiting. 
I looked it up in the old Webster's Dictionary before it got all convoluted with all that humanology, that uh, humanism that it uh, has in it right now, before the scriptures were taken out. The 1869 version of the Webster's Dictionary. It says to wait means to... All right, let me ask you a question. Let's do this. If I say, give me what your definition of wait is, this lady with the blonde hair, what would you say wait to, if I say, explain to wait what wait means to you? To sit still. Okay? Let me ask a husband who has to wait on his wife. Any husbands out there? Brother in the green shirt, what does wait mean to you? It means you can't, so it's negative, isn't it? Wait is not a good, wait is, I told everybody to be at the restaurant at 6.30. It's now 7.30. Where are they? I am sick of waiting. See, again, that's how we've unlearned just a simple word. The church is full of things that we've learned to do wrong. Listen to what the actual definition of wait is. It says this. It says, to stay or rest in expectation. To stay or rest in expectation. To stop or remain stationary till the arrival of some person or event. I would have never put rest in the definition of wait, would you? But the Lord says, they that wait upon me will renew their strength. Waiting on the Lord is a good thing. Waiting to see what he's going to do is a good thing. But our churches are such short order cooks. I go to churches all the time. Miss Judy was with me at a church one time, a young man pastoring, awesome man of God, hungry for the Lord. And I said, man, I'm here to lead worship. He said, praise God. He said, I said, how long do I have? He says, 20 minutes. Good. Glory to God. We'll shake hands at least. And I asked him before the week is over, I said, Brother, is there a time that you all just wait on the Lord? And he said, Well, you know, I, we're here in a city where it's commuting all the time. And see, he's a very understanding pastor. He's trying to understand his congregation. But I challenged him to do this. I said, Do this. Either your Sunday night meeting, your Friday night meeting, some meeting you have at night on the weekend. Start opening the end of the service. Go through your whole service as normal. And then at the end of the service, say, you know what? Anybody who wants to wait, the band and the worship team, we're going to stay right here. We're going to sing and worship the Lord. And we're just going to wait. See, what I know is that in the early days of Brownsville Revival, the miracles happened while we waited. The Allison Ward video you saw, her sister our pastor's son, all those miracles happened right over here at 4 o'clock in the morning while some of us were standing around waiting to see what God was going to do next. The good he comes from God when you wait on him. Oh, Lindell, does that mean i got to stay up to 4 o'clock all the time? I didn't say that. I'm saying that there needs to be waiting. Whatever God's about to do, it's going to come through those who wait on him. The scripture says in James 5 and 7, be patient then, brothers, and wait until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains? Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the wait for the morning. More than the watchman wait for the morning. I wait for the Lord. Hebrews 10, 36. You need to persevere so that when you have done all the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Hang in there and wait on it. Now, that's all I'm going to do in the way of teaching. Aren't you glad? I'm going to tell you what I saw God do just a few weeks ago. It's changed my life. I'll never be the same. I understand if you can't go here with me, it's okay. I don't expect you to. But I am a mess for God. I am messed up. I've been in revival. I've seen some mighty things in this building. I've seen the hand of the Lord come in some mighty ways. 
I've seen salvations. I've seen miraculous deliverances. I've seen people who were on our usher team. One man who used to beat his wife and drink all week long. He got saved. God turned him totally around. And she said, that's not even the man I married. That's a miracle. When God turns someone around like that, he had no ch tr previous church experience, no pr re previous religion in his life at all. Just a good old heathen, a fresh heathen. I like fresh heathens. Came in here, God got a hold of his life. Changed. There are multiplied stories like that. Multiplied. So salvation is the core of what we are here. But what I saw, I was invited... I've been invited now for about a year or better to go to Mexico, and I never wanted to go. I love to do missions work in Russia and the Ukraine and Europe. Eastern Europe was where I felt really the Lord had called me, and I get a real passion for that, but I didn't get too excited. Mexico, I just never thought of it as where I wanted to go. Have you ever felt that way about a place? Like, I'll give you money to go, but I just don't want to go. And... A young man named Enrique Bremer who came here several times to translate when Claudio Freyson was here preaching uh, has, has an excellent spirit. He has an excellent spirit and the purest countenance about himself. And every time he would come, he'd say, Lindell, I'm looking forward to when you come to us in Parral, Mexico. And I said, yeah, well, okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, how's that? Sure is good to see you again. How's your wife? Finally, he was, he persevered enough that I said, okay. Larry called me and said, look, this guy wants you to come to Mexico. He keeps calling. He's like wearing us to death. Are you going to go? I said, well, okay, I'll go. So we set up a two-day a two meeting there. And then Larry calls me back. Could I have some water, please? Larry calls me back and says, Lindell, there's kind of a kink in the plan. I said, what's the kink? He said, he wants three services a day. <laughs> you understand when I go out, I still have to come back and do what I do here. So if I blow all of my energy out on the road, by the time I get here, thank you, Becky. By the time I get back here on, uh, on Friday night, if I don't have any get up and go, they're liable to tell me to get up and go. So, I thought, man, I can't, excuse me, I thought, I can't do three services. I said, call him back and tell him I just can't do it. I, they'll, they'll kill me. Larry called me back again. He said, hey, they're persistent, three a day. I said, okay, I'll do it. Because you also know, I have a ministry. We have an overhead of $31,000 a month just to pay our bills. When you go to Mexico, you get jack now it's not about money for me but I do like to make sure that my employees eat you know I have a responsibility to make sure if I'm going to go out it, I'm, it's worthwhile financially for the for the ministry too even though I love going to small churches I love going to all places but I have to make they're coming after me they ain't coming after you <laughs> And so, I, you know, you go, well, well, I'm going to go over there and kill myself. And, you know, it's, I'm going to have to go to another week to just try to make the ends meet. And that's reality in ministry. And so I get on the plane on Sunday afternoon after a big Sunday morning service, flew and got there at, got to the airport at 9.30 or 10 at night. Then we had a two and a half hour drive because it was in the middle of nowhere. So we get it, we get there and we're, we're talking, pastor's so sweet, Brother Bremer picks us up, and we're on our way from the airport, and I'm, I'm noticing that we're in the middle of a desert. I said, where are we at? He said, well, this is high desert. He said, it's actually a mile high, just like Denver, Colorado. He said, but it's desert. I said, so do you get rainfall? He said, well, yes, we do, but our rainfall is restricted to two months a year, being July and August. I said, well, you know, we're just making conversation. It's trying to stay awake till we get to the, in the hotel. He says... I said, do it, does it ever rain in May? I was there in May. He said, no. He said, as a matter of fact, we're in 11-year drought, and for it to rain in May would be a miracle. And I thought, well, okay, you know, we're just talking about the weather. I have let it pass. I went on to the meeting. Monday morning, bright and early, I got up. They picked me up. I got to my session. 
I was teaching on the heart, which I haven't even got to talk to y'all about, but I figured you knew it. Uh, I was talking about the heart of the Father, and I was talking about when is God going to get his. We all get ours all the time. We get our blessings. We get our healing. We get our salvation. We get all. When's God going to get something? When is he going to show up to his house and somebody brought him something instead of a request? But we just bring him something to pour on him. And I was talking about that. And then I started in the beginning of the scripture and I started talking about Genesis and how the children of Israel, and, you know, were just belly acres and, and spoiled. And, and here God is trying to reach to them and all the way through to Hosea where God tells Hosea to marry the prostitute and to show them, the people, a physical way of how the, the children of Israel had treated him. And I said, God has hurt. He's been hurt. He's been rejected. He's been abused. And I said, well, here we are in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit has come. Salvation has come. His son has died on the cross. And still, our churches are filled with everything but anything for him. It's all for us. And I said these words, when is God going to get his? When is God going to get his? And man, like a wave, I was 30 minutes in, and people started weeping. And they just fell on the floor weeping. Conviction of the Holy Spirit just swept the place. I said something like, we get up and do our rehearsals and play our little worship songs. I hear worship leaders say to me all the time, man, when I sing this song, the glory really comes. Watch this. And I watch, and I'm not impressed. Because you don't call God's glory in like that. He don't come in on your favorite song. He comes in on your worship when it's true, when it's pure. So I was saying stuff like that. For, for a long time, they stand on their faces just repenting and weeping. We got finally back up to our feet because we had a morning, an afternoon, and a night. So we got to the afternoon, and I was speaking about the glory of the Lord. And I said, I said, I believe God's glory is about to come to Mexico. At the moment I said that, a peal of thunder. <laughs> We all stopped and looked up because it's not supposed to do that in May. And when I drove in that morning, it was clear blue sky. A peal of thunder. <laughs> and it started raining on that metal roof, <laughs> just coming down. Just like, I mean, like summer afternoon thunder shower, just boom. But it wasn't a thunder shower. It rained all day. So much so that by the time I was finishing my two and a half hour session, the pastor's wife, Tita, came in and she said, I hate to interrupt, but people's cars are washing down the street. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, that's, that was neat, but that was, it didn't really hit me that hard. Next day, Tuesday, we have a great meeting that night. Nothing just over the top, but a great meeting. You always have great meetings in Mexico. It is just, get out of the United States, it's just great. Get away from those fat church people, and you have a great time. You just get out there where people are hungry, man. You just have church. And you just go, God, and it's just goes, boom. It's those American church. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all got, got some of them in your church, too? It's like you got to go, come on, come on, come on, come on. You feel like I'm more like a cheerleader than a worship leader. Like, rah, 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 Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> so, Tuesday morning, we start the meeting. I come to church. Note that it's a clear blue sky again. It's really cool after all that rain we had the night before. The streets are still wet, but the sky is just blue. Driving in, and the pastor commented. He said, man, that, that thunderstorm was just unusual. He said, I, I think that was a significant sign from the Lord. And I, you know, I'm, I'm still going, eh, coincidence. It was a thunderstorm. Praise the Lord for it. You know what I mean? Nice, nice. 
the second day, I'm speaking. And long about mid-morning to afternoon, somewhere in there, I say it again. I believe by the Holy Ghost that the power of God is about to sweep through Mexico. And His glory is going to come and bring revival to this nation. This time, it was not only a peal of thunder, but it was low. It shook the building. You know what I mean? That kind of rattles the window. <laughs> this scared me. Because this time, instead of rain, hail started falling, pelting the building. And again, it rained all afternoon until time for the evening service. It was still raining. When that rain started falling, the people just were amazed. In that night, in the meeting, we started the meeting, and they worshiped an hour and a half before I even got there. I stepped inside the building and went to the front with the pastor, and they turned the service to me, and I thought, well, you know, what do I do? I mean, this is good worship. What else can I? Mike, do you ever feel that way? I don't know if he's still there, but you, where are you, Mike? Do you ever feel that way when you get invited somewhere and they got good worship? You're going, well, what am I here for? You know what I mean? What am I supposed to overdo that? Am I supposed to one-upmanship that and try to do? It was great worship. What am I, you know? So I thought, well, I'll do a song or two. So I did happy songs, so we all danced. I would did enemies camp, and we all danced because I like to dance as much as any Mexican that ever lived. And so I, I just had a big time and party, and it was good. And, I, I did a worship course called uh, Your Mercy Goes Much Deeper. I got to the end of that song, and I started playing something real simple, just a four-chord four chord progression. And over it, I just started singing hallelujah, just over the melody. And the people joined in. And they joined in. And they joined in. Well, I was used to America. You know, you can't sustain, like last night. We sustained a long area of worship last night. That's unusual in America because usually it dies out after a few minutes. We figured out we give God his cursory 2.3 2 seconds. That's it. But this went on for 35 or 40 minutes. And I even kind of let off the keyboard playing the chords thinking they would stop. They kept going. And I literally felt like electric in the room, in the air. And the Lord began to show me that the heavens were open. That these Mexican people had opened the heavens with that hallelujah. They had opened it up with their worship. I mean, it was open. And you could just feel the charge of the electricity of the Lord in the room. And I knew that we were about to see something. God was about to do something. Something supernatural was about to happen. Because you don't get that kind of electricity in a room without something happening. And wouldn't you know it that we had, after that died down just a little bit, a Talamari Indian lady, something about those Indians, the, the, the keepers of the land, was over on that side of the building. My keyboard was over here. Everybody got quiet except for her, and she was older, and she was speaking in a, in a, in a broken voice, a feeble voice, but she was crying from the pit of her guts, and she was praying in the Spirit. And the Lord said, she's praying and interceding for Mexico in the Holy Ghost. Tell the people she's interceding for Mexico in the Holy Ghost. I said that to the people. And immediately, they all went into intercession. I mean, corporately. No, no lull, just boom. Children five, six, seven-year-old, they were full. It was full up here. They were all laying on their faces. Some of them were in fetal positions for three and a half hours interceding for Mexico. We were about 10 minutes into intercession. The Lord said to me, he said, go over to Pastor Enrique and tell him that they need to pray, to pray against the spirit of idolatry, that the heavens are open and now they need to declare. It's what Lila has been teaching us is that when the heavens get open with your worship, God doesn't want you just to worship and then not do anything with it. See, a lot of people get built up into a worship thing and God opens the heavens and that's it. That's it. it just dies out. But see, when you've got his ear and the heavens are open and God is there, it's time to start declaring whatever it is that God wants to happen. 
You can declare what you want to happen, won't, it won't happen. But when you start declaring the word of the Lord and what God's kingdom is doing, God hears it because he's open to heaven so he can. Wow. Enrique said, I'll wait just a minute till it feels right. A few moments later, he, start, he, he started praying against the spirit of idolatry. I have never heard a roar from a crowd like that in my life. I've never heard that decibel of sound. It was like, it was like an explosion of prayer. And it felt like something in the spirit was being broken. God started giving prophetic words to pastors. One of the pastors stood up and said, she pulled up a scripture, and I can't recall where it is, but she pulled up a scripture about hail and lightning. And the pastor himself said in Revelation 4 or 5, said all the things that we're seeing in this meeting are things that God has around his throne. And they also talked about a scripture. She brought up a scripture. I think it's Jeremiah or somewhere where God stores the hail in the heavens for the times of war. Well, the more she started talking, the more it just got wilder. And it got quiet a minute, and the Lord said, somebody needs to prophesy on their instrument. And I thought, well, I don't even know what that is. And I looked for the drummer, Garrett, and he wasn't anywhere around. So I thought, I used to drum. So I grabbed the drumsticks, got on the drum throne, and I started, when I started playing, it like escalated a couple more. I mean, people went nuts. And I did a 35-minute drum solo. I played Wipeout, everything I knew. And when I would lay back on it, they would go down in, in intensity. But then when I would come back out strong, it was just like, wow. For three and a half hours, we did this. Where it really gets interesting is when you start hearing the testimonies. And I'm told they're still coming in. As a matter of fact, in one day, I had never been invited, but to that one place in Mexico, now my whole year next year looks like it's going to be Mexico because, because everybody is, I mean, I didn't know that there were churches of 10,000 people there represented because we were sitting around eating tacos and it was just plain old folks to me because they're not like us in America. There's not a haughtiness about them. You know, if they've got a big church or a big anything. They're just humble folks. We just sit around there sharing beans and burritos. It was wonderful. And sitting and talking about the things of the Lord. When we started to intercede that night, I noticed that all the kids hit the floor at the same time, but I didn't know why. I looked behind me, and the guitar player hit the floor. And, and, and Charlie, when he hit the floor, he had his guitar. He was standing up, and he folded his guitar into his lap and fell, like, face first, and he had his hands over his head like the building was falling. And I thought, well, that's odd. But at the same time, probably 20, 30 kids down the front did the same thing. What I found out when I questioned him after church, and I questioned some of the kids because I was curious. I kept hearing the stories. I didn't see this. What, what, why is it I can't see this stuff? They told me there were two earthquakes. The children felt it. The guitar player felt it. People on the stage felt it. I didn't feel it. Two earthquakes. One that does this, straight up and down, and one that rolled. Two. And the guitar player literally fell to cover his head because he thought that he was from Mexico City. He knew, what, he knew what earthquakes were. And he thought maybe the building was going to fall in. All kinds of mysterious things went on in that meeting. Stories were endless. Because it was three and a half hours of roaring intercession and worship. I've never been in anything to date like it. After the meeting is where it really got a little weird for me. But I'm saying, God, bring it on. Weird and all. I just take it. The guitar player said while he had his head covered, he walked up. We were sitting at the pastor's house after church eating at about 3 in the morning. <laughs> and he said, he said, to the pastor's wife, he says, Teeth, I want to thank you so much for putting that fan on me when I fell on the floor because I was so hot. I was scared. I thought the earthquake was coming. But then when I got down there, I felt the glory of the Lord. And he was from a church in Mexico City that really didn't believe in revival. They were against revival. They had preached against revival. 
And he said, thank you so much for putting that fan on me, that oscillating fan. She said, honey, I didn't put a fan on you. He said, oh, you had to. He said, I felt it. It would blow by me, and then it would go, and then it would come back, and it would blow. And every time it would come, it'd get, the, the wind would get stronger. As a matter of fact, I thought, well, that has got to be a huge fan. He said, but I wasn't able to even look up. He said, the glory of the Lord had me pinned to the floor, and I couldn't even open my eyes. But I was so thankful. I remember when I was laying there, I was thanking God that somebody put a fan on me. And he said, it was blowing my hair and messing it up. He said, it was strong. She said, I had no fan to put on you. As a matter of fact, there was no fan in the whole building. He starts crying. He said, I didn't believe in any of this. He said, but I felt two earthquakes and I felt a fan on me. Here's a better one. A pastor from a large church in, in middle Mexico, in the middle of intercession that night, got mad because he felt like people were throwing rocks at him. He said, something hit me in the back of the head, and I turned around to see who it was. And he said, it was falling on my shoulders. He said, I looked up, and hail was falling out of the sky inside the building. Big stones of hail falling on me. One man's wife told the story that he was a wife abuser. He beat her and neglected her. He was an unbeliever. She brought him to the meeting that night. When the intercession started, she noticed that water was just dripping off of him. But he was just standing in the meeting. Water just dripping off of him everywhere. Off his nose. Said it looked like you turned a bucket over his head. It was just running everywhere. She called the pastor the next morning. She said, my husband's been up all night praying and repenting. He's been, said he's been tormented all night. He's scared to death. He said, why is he scared? He said, because he said it rained on him all, all the time we were praying. He said, there was rain falling. He said, he looked around. It was falling on nobody else in the audience. He looked up, and there wasn't a hole in the roof, but rain was falling on him. He said, it scared him so bad, he repented. What is this? It's signs. It's wonders. See, it's hard for us to believe and expect those things. I'll tell you further. This even gets even freakier. We had Samsonite chairs in that meeting. Those plastic kind you stack. There were probably 1,200 folks or so in the meetings at night. That night after church, they were picking things up to lock the building. And the staff walked in, and a couple of them noticed that there was water in chairs for four rows from the front. Water standing in the chairs. You know, Samsonite chairs can hold a little water. About that deep, water. So they got mops and towels, and they went in there and noticed that they were afraid the carpet had been ruined or the roof had leaked during the rain. They checked the roof. Nothing wrong with the roof. It's a new building, two years old. They felt the carpet. The carpet was dry. They cleaned it up, didn't think anything about it, thought it was strange. Until the next morning when they came back in to turn the lights on to do business, to do the, to do a, uh, clean up after the meetings those four rows were full again when they went to clean it up they realized it wasn't water at all it was a very light gauged oil where'd the oil come from go figure why would God do something like that I don't know why did God translate Philip he had a purpose it's a sign it's a wonder Am I seeking signs? No, 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 no. I'm seeking the sign and wonder giver. But I'm telling you folks, we are on the precipice of change. And there is about to come a wind of God into the house of God that's going to change the way things are done. Now, the, uh, the whole church ain't going to go for it. There's going to be a lot of people going to go sign us off as radicals and fanatics. But we are not going to be a ragtag little fanatical bunch over here. It's about to explode on the face of the earth because if you pick up the paper you read the nasty mess going on in the nations right now it is going to take in this nation it may take signs and wonders to bring people back to God but I believe God is about to do that and I don't know how you feel but I know how I feel and here's the way it is I am tired of playing ministry I don't want to do this as a vocation anymore I've already done this been there got a t-shirt got a video I'm excited it's a wonderful thing but this is not what I 
I love to do. I find myself not even enjoying being the music director at Brownsville anymore. I'm like, I don't want to do this for a living. Do I have to do this for a living? If I have to do this for a living, I'd rather go actually make some good money. I want to see the God I've been told that's there. I want to see what he can do. I've been told when I was a boy that there would be meetings where miracles would take place and healings would take place. I want to see it. Now, before we go from this place, if God healed you last night and it was undeniable to you that he healed you, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to give God glory for what he did. You know that God healed you. This is not power of suggestion. I want to make sure you don't feel any power of suggestion on this. Okay, we're doing this for a reason. Let me tell you why. Not so that you'll all send me an offering. We're doing this because we want to honor the Lord and let him know that we want to see healings and miracles come. And we're going to thank him for the humble beginnings and we're going to thank him when the dead walk. We're going to thank him when multiple sclerosis is healed, we're going to thank him when a headache is healed because he's a miracle-working God. Here's our brother from Puerto Rico. Just briefly, what did the Lord do? Uh, well, um, I had this terrible pain in my back since uh, a few years ago. And um, can I be sincere? I lift up my hand here, and these folks here prayed for me. And I thought, I'm, I'm healed, you know. But I went back to bed, the pain got worse. So when this morning I come here, uh, I don't know, somebody asked who were healed. So I lift my, my arm, and that's when the heal took place. <laughs> I was, I was, wow. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. If you have children, you may need to go get them. We're just going to take a minute more. I want to get ready. I want, I want to end this meeting today on a high note. I want us to go out of here worshiping the Lord. Mike, get something ready. Get the musicians ready. Get us something full of jubilee that we can rejoice with the Lord. And we might turn some of these instruments loose. And then we're going to let you get some rest for this afternoon. Hi. What did the Lord do? Hi. Hi. Um I have the acid reflux thing, and I've been taking a pill every day for the last three years. And if I don't take that pill, it's like I'm having a heart attack. I can't stand it. I wake up in the middle of the night. It's just burning terrible. And last night, when you said it, you know, touch whatever it is that's hurting, I haven't. I, I didn't bring my pills with me because I knew the Lord was going to heal me, you know. And if I don't take my, I've took a pill now since Monday. Okay, and usually I'd be like on fire, but. I have nothing. I have nothing. God. Praise God. Praise God. I have been diagnosed with some cataract, with a cataract in my right eye. And I would also have, I have little floating cataracts. And I, I mean, ever since last night, I can look around now. I can look, and they're, not, they're gone. They're gone. I also, um, I have, um, since about 1995, I've been treated for an underactive thyroid. And my doctor has me on one of the highest doses that anybody has ever been put on. And I have to go back and see him on Wednesday. But I said, I praise God, because Monday, when they were bringing the flag of healing around, yeah. I proclaimed the healing for this thyroid. And I said, my doctor may never take me off of the medicine, but I will never, ever have another higher dose again. Never. I Let's give the Lord praise. Yes. Last night, I didn't know that Jesus was a chiropractor, too. I had some other problems that I can't mention. But when I fell out under the power of the Holy Spirit last night, um, my neck popped. And I thought, well, that was strange. And then in a few minutes, I felt other parts of my body begin to... I felt like alignment was coming. And a lot of my problems, I think, was probably things were out of line. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We're doing this quick. I just want to give the Lord glory. I also have two things. Uh, I felt the Lord. She had her hand on my back, and I felt my uh, right side pop. 
and, and then a pop in my neck, and there was soreness there in both places uh, later as we started home, but there's nothing there now. And I asked the Lord last night for a straight spine and also for my vision as far as looking at a distance to be clearer, and it, was, it has cleared up a lot, a lot. And my back. Praise God. How about you? Well, I don't know what the Lord healed me of because it hasn't been revealed to me, but I know when I prayed last night and I put my hands up, it was like my palms opened up and it was like burning, searing heat running down through my arms. So I know I was healed of something, but I don't know what it was. Praise God. Let's give the Lord glory. I'm trying to do this in a hurry here. What did the Lord do? I was born with celiac disease, meaning I can't absorb anything with gluten or milk or anything like that. And on Monday night, a lady came up to me and it was when someone, we were all praying for everybody and I don't even know how I got there, but she said, there's something wrong with your stomach, right? And I said, yes. And she said, is there a pain right here? And I said, yes, there is. And I never told her anything and she just grabbed it and yanked it out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I never felt anything like that in my life. And she, she just grabbed it and it was gone. And she said, well, what's wrong with you? And I explained, well, I have this. And she said, no, you had that. And I was like, okay. And I've always been nervous about saying I was healed because I've had prayer all my life. But then um, last night um, when we were all receiving healing, I was like, I'm just going to receive healing and I'm going to proclaim that this is in my life. And I felt God remove things out of my body and then this morning there was a pain on this side of my stomach and I was like well I'm still gonna say I'm healed so when you asked I said I raised my hand yes I was healed and then when I stood up to testify the pain went away and it's not there anymore so. <laughs> found out when you get healed it don't you have to sometimes war through it because sometimes it tries to come back you have to trust the Lord yes um, as we worship last night, you ask uh, if we ever has a back problem, back back pains. Uh, lift up your hands, both hands. So I lift it up, and um, I had a chronic back pain since uh, 1987, and um, it's gone. Every morning I get up in the morning, my husband usually uh, give me a back rub. I had no backache this morning, yeah. and uh, thank you. Lord. And another thing, and I had a um, UTI, and I've been having a, I've been having that problem since uh, my hysterectomy, and off and on. So I always carry a little medicine. And uh, yesterday morning we were there, and, and I was having a symptomatic. And, and I I told my husband I think we need to leave a little bit early because I didn't bring my medicine. And um, I said, but. I'm going to trust God, God will heal me. I have not taken the medication and I slept good last night and I have no symptoms. Praise Amen. God. Praise God, praise God. Yes. Yeah, recently I've been having back problems and stuff, so when you asked us to raise our hands and stuff for the back problems, several people come and they prayed over me and I fell out and I could just feel the pain leaving me and I was just saying I receive it and I just, it was the Holy Spirit was just coming over me that night. And I just praise God for it. Amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Just a few more and we'll be done here. Here we go. Um, last night when you were, you called for the back pain, I also did that. I raised my hands and I was receiving healing, but I knew it was more than that. It was more than just the back pain. And uh, um, I have problems where my hip shifts out and I'm totally crooked and... Um, uh, I just, I can't explain it, but there was an incredible healing that went more than just the back, the pain last night, and uh, I just know that there is, there's something, there's a deeper emotional healing and a, a mental healing that has gone on that I am free, Praise free God. from. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Yes, ma'am. My healing, um, but those from my church can hear my voice, is not totally there but i had sinus strange and my head felt like it felt like it was going to explode last night and god is just saying to me you may be looking for an instant healing but that may not be what i have and i just began to praise god because i know that he is beginning the healing and as a music teacher and singer i gotta have my voice and i know that it's not totally there but it's 
10 times better than what it was last night. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't even talk to my son last night. And I know that he has started that process, and I thank him because he is able to complete the good work that he has started. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, God did several things in me um, just throughout this conference. Um, first of all, I suffer from severe allergies, and I do worship at our church, and it got so bad to where just the first song was over, and I was already lightheaded because I couldn't even breathe. And God healed me, and um, I had a, a stomach problem for over seven years, and God healed me from that. And um, I had something that happened at our church, and I was just very, very broken, and I was very frustrated, and God throughout this whole conference is just breaking it off. And I'm, I'm healed. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like this. This is good. Uh, yeah, I haven't been able to focus really good for about a year or so. And last night when I touched my eyes, I can, I'm starting to focus a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. So hopefully I can, by the time it's over, I can really see again. So. Absolutely. Let's believe the Lord for that completely. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes, ma'am. Well, last night I raised my hand for back. I have a, an appointment to go in for an MRI exam, and I can't wait to go because I l literally felt hot, something hot liquid like pour down my spine last night. And it is gone. First, it got worse, like the gentleman over there said. The pain was worse after I got pregnant. I thought, but I've been here before, so I know how to do warfare. So it's gone. I'm healed. Praise the Lord. And you? Um, when I was packing to leave home, I was pulling things out of my drawer, and I had this fever blister medication. And I thought, I don't need that. You know, I've used it before. I don't want to include it in my things. It may be contaminated. And when I woke up yesterday, I had this fever blister on my lip. And I thought, what is this? And he goes, remember, you have the medication. So I put it on, and I just prayed yesterday that it wouldn't get any bigger because they tend to get bigger sometimes. And when I woke up this morning, I just prayed, Jesus, you know, I don't want this there. I just curse those cells. I, you know, I demand them to be gone. And he says, you know, you have to believe even the smallest things. So I wasn't going to say anything, but when you said even when a headache, when we pray for a headache, when I got out of the shower, I was you know, not going to touch, and I wiped it, and the blister went away, and since then, it's not done anything, and they usually take seven to ten days to heal, right. and it's gone. It's Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's everybody stand to your feet. We want you to know that we've enjoyed having you at this conference, and tonight will be the final service. You're welcome to stay with us Friday night. <sighs> I don't know, but I feel like God did some major miracles last night, and I think we're going to have time to hear them. But the thing of it is, is we have to start here thanking the Lord. And a lot of people, you know, let me explain to you what you're going to deal with as we move into whatever it is the Lord has for us. We're going to deal with our mind that's going to tell us, ah, God can't do this. This is all psychological. We have things on television telling us about faith healers and all that sort of thing. But I'm telling you right now, what God is going to do is different. It's not going to be about a faith healer. It's going to about, be about Jesus. And it's going to happen when we worship him. And he's going to come into his house. And he's going to bring healing in his house. And I believe it's going to be noised about the nation and the nations that there's healing in the house of the Lord. I believe that with all my heart because I believe it's God's will. Now, we're still about souls, but we're also about whatever God wants to do because we've decided here that, Lord, whatever you want, we want to give you something. We want to give you something. And here's my belief. I thank you for healings and miracles and signs and wonders, but if I never see anything else, I love you enough to tell you, Lord, you're worthy if you never do one other thing. But if you got it in your heart, Lord, to begin to show yourself in the nations, Lord, I am not going to doubt it. I'm going to go for it full, full blast. Amen? Amen? Amen. Lila, you want to come and tell us what we want to do? You got something ready to go? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good one. Where's that Texas lady that got so loose last night? Where's she at? Right there. Bless you, honey. She embarrassed herself, I think. She got so free. But I'm telling you what, it was a freedom of the Lord in this place last night. I still feel it here this morning. So but why don't we just worship the Lord with this song? And uh, if you need to go get your kids, go get them. Bring them in here and we'll rejoice together. If you want to grab an instrument up here and play it a little bit and have a good time, let's do it. But make sure you return them, please. Okay? God bless you. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to praise a little longer than before. I want to lift my hands higher than before. Shout a little louder than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. Freedom, 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 freedom.
yes Lord, 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 amen. I oppressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Sorrows may last for the night in the joy.
wish you could be up here. This is like a bunch of kids at recess. All got new toys. Don't you think that, don't you think, you know what I see in the spirit sometimes when I worship the Lord? I told you I visualize a lot. When I sing a song like that, I think about when I do something like a procession or a march. Do you ever visualize what it would be like when we finally are with Jesus? I mean, we don't really know what he's going to look like, but if you ever just visualize being a bunch of kids just chasing after him. I just see us sometimes in a field of just yellow flowers and just a bunch of kids just following behind the Lord, skipping through the flowers. Somebody say, oh, that's, 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 that's just, you go on with what you think, I don't know what I think, but I, I look for this time, sometime we get to worshiping like this and we do these kind of processional things and people play their instruments before the Lord. It's fun to worship God. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, I want to borrow all these. I think I'd like, I think I could learn to play some of these because I can do rhythm. I can't blow anything, but I, those big old horns, I can't do that. Thank you so much for coming and being a part with us. Now, tonight will be Tommy Tenney at 7 o'clock. Get some rest. We love you so much. And, and let me say one thing as a disclaimer, just to make sure we don't get in too hot, much hot water. Anything you try at home, do it under your pastor's supervision. And if he don't like it, we didn't do it. <laughs> you have to understand that when we do worship conferences, we do what we want to do. And pastor gives us freedom here to do that. But make sure you don't cause more trouble at home. than We, we don't want to get the call back, all right? But just be free in the spirit. If you can't do it at church, just take these at home. Don't take these home, but... Get, get, get at home and start worshiping the Lord. Thank you. Bless you. The Lord be with you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.